Why do we live holy? Why do we live righteous? We live and we do good things because we are saved, not to get saved. Amen. Hallelujah. So let me tell you something. Their perception of salvation, because yes, they believe you have to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But there's also, but the thing is, they don't even understand why you have to accept Yeshua as Lord and Savior. They don't even understand the significance or why that's even the thing. Because they're saying, oh, well, he's the Archangel Michael. He's this, he's that, and all those things. But you know what? If you don't understand who he is, you will never understand the weight that giving your life to him really carries and what that really means for us. See, the thing is, they teach that there is no hell, that there is all that. Let me tell you something. I've been to hell. And I'm telling you, one of the biggest lies that the enemy is using is trying to convince people that there is no hell. You don't even understand what hell really is. You don't even understand why hell even exists. So you can't even say, because some people are trying to say, well, why would God throw me into hell? Why? Why would a loving, powerful God throw me into hell? Let me tell you something. Hell is not because God hates people. Hell is because people hate God. It's for people who did not love God or who did not accept God or listen to God because you need to understand that's what he values. You have to understand that when you go to heaven, heaven is a kingdom. It is not a church. It's a kingdom. It's a government. God says that a house divided cannot stand. He does not tolerate rebellion in his kingdom. Do you understand this here? Because I've been to heaven and I tell you everything in heaven loves God. Let me ask you something. What you want to say, well, that's not fair. What's more fair or what is just and what is unjust for you to stand before God and be forced to worship him for all eternity and to follow his rules and regulations, to be forced to do that or for you to have a choice. Which is more just or unjust? Which one would you have a problem with? That if you got to heaven and you were forced to worship God. And you were forced, because I tell you the truth, everything in heaven loves God. Everything in heaven obeys God. There is no debating God in heaven. I tell you the truth. If you are standing before, what is more just for him to force you to worship him or for you to choose to worship him now unto eternity to choose to live for him because he loves you like no other because he is worthy because he is the Lord all by himself. I'll let you decide that. But let me get into the word. Who has their Bible ready? Let's go to Isaiah 59 because I feel like destroying some Jehovah Witness doctrine and teaching. But first, let me go into this real quick. I'm going to show y'all so that they don't um, say anything about me. So do me a favor. Does this say JehovahWitness.org? Do y'all see that on your screen? Does that say JehovahWitness.org? Okay, then. So this is Jehovah Witness site. This isn't um, a Christian site. Okay, fair enough. Let me go to the part that I need to get to, salvation. Let me go to salvation, heaven, and then I'm going to go to hell, Okay because they don't believe in hell. Sorry, but let me read this. Oh, this is so sad, but let me read this. 
Deliverance from sin and death is possible through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. To benefit from that sacrifice, people must not only exercise faith in Jesus, but also change their course of life and get baptized. A person's work proves that his faith is alive. However, salvation cannot be earned. It comes through the undeserved kindness of God. See, like they're trying to sound very Christian. Okay, let me show you. Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, and the faithful angels reside in the spirit realm. A relatively small number of people, 144,000, will be resurrected to life in heaven to rule with Jesus in the kingdom. That is false. That is all the way false, and that is a twist of the scripture. Evil and suffering. These began when one of God's angels rebelled. This angel who after his rebellion was called Satan and devil persuaded the first human couple to join him and the consequences have been disastrous for their descendants. In order to settle the moral issues raised by Satan, God has allowed evil and suffering, but he will not permit them to continue forever. What have you guys been reading? This is their belief. This is their doctrine. I didn't take it. That's what they said. So let's, let's tackle the first thing. Why do you need salvation from Yeshua? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to Isaiah 59. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 59 and we're going to start at verse 15. Right now, just say, Lord, give me revelation. Just ask the Lord right now to give you revelation as we are about to dive in here. I'm about to have fun with this. All right, so let's pull this up. Isaiah 59, verse 15. What does it say? It says, truth cannot be found anywhere, and people who refuse to do evil are attacked. The Lord looked and could not find any justice, and he was displeased. He could not find anyone to help the people. He was surprised that there was no one to help. So he used his own power to save the people. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does that say? It says the Lord, right? It says God, right? Okay, let's continue. He could not find anyone to help the people, and he was surprised that there was no one to help. So he used his own power to save the people. His own goodness gave him strength. He covered himself with goodness like armor. He put the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on his clothes for punishing and wrapped himself in the coat of his strong love. The Lord will pay back his enemies for what they have done. He will show his anger to those who were against him. He will punish the people in faraway places as they deserve. Then people from the West will fear the Lord and people from the East will fear his glory. The Lord will come quickly like a fast flowing river driven by the breath of the Lord. Then a savior will come to Jerusalem and to the people of Jacob who have turned from sin, says the Lord. The Lord says, this is my agreement with these people. My spirit and my words that I give you will never leave you or your children or your grandchildren now and forever. So let me help y'all out here. So what that scripture is saying is that God was looking for the plan of salvation and he found no one who could do it. He didn't find man, he did not find angels. Now let me tell you why the doctrine of saying an angel like um, Michael, um, could redeem mankind or give us salvation. Let me tell you why that doctrine is false. Because God could not trust the angels to complete this work. Uh-oh. Simba, what are you talking about? The angels already failed God twice in the Bible. Y'all didn't think about that, did you? The angels already failed God twice. So how is he going to trust them 
to save his most precious creation. Come on. Yes. So you see, first off, we know Hillel, Lucifer, right? He caused one third of the angels. And again, that's not one third of the entire angels. That just means his crew. He got his crew to rebel against God, to force God to kick him out of heaven, right? But how many of you remember that Lucifer, Satan, also caused the angels to fall called the Watchers? The Watchers who were angels who decided to sleep with mortal women, defiling themselves and producing half human, half angel offspring. Which caused God to be so angry that he punishes the angels and they're still bound to this day and cause him to cause the flood to destroy all of creation. You're telling me he wants to trust angels to save man when they were the cause of their fall in the first place. Now, not all the angels, y'all know, angels are my friends. But what I'm talking about is the race of the angels already failed. So, the next time someone tries to bring up, in fact, I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to go to Jude real quick. Jude chapter one, because I want y'all to see something. Okay. I'm going to go to Jude one, and then I'm going to go to Matthew four. See, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Who here is learning something? Look at this. What does Jude 1 say? Let's go to Jude 1. And I'm going to start right here. So look at this. Verse 8. What does it say? Jude chapter 1 verse 8. It is the same with these people who have entered your group. They are guided by dreams and make themselves filthy with sin. They reject God's authority and speak against the angels. Now watch this. Not even the archangel Michael, when he argued with the devil about who could, who would have the body of Moses, dared to judge the devil guilty. Do you know what that means? I'll explain that. It was, so it says that not even the archangel Michael, when he argued with the devil, about who would have the body of Moses dare to judge the devil guilty. Instead, he said, the Lord punish you. He said, the Lord punish you. So right there, let me tell you something. So here it is. You see that Archangel Michael, you want to know why he's arguing with the devil? And you know why? He, basically, let me put it to you like this. Satan is arguing about Moses' body, he's saying that the body belongs to him because when Moses died, he died in sin and there was no intercessor. So what happens is M Michael comes in to argue and say, no, that body belongs to God because of the glory that was on Moses. But because Satan held a higher rank than he did, why? Because Satan is called the God of this world. He had legal rights to Moses. So Michael was only a prince. Michael is only called a prince in the scriptures. Go read Daniel. He's called prince. So Satan's rank outranked him. So he did not go against him because he couldn't. He didn't have the authority. So what does Michael do? He said, the Lord himself rebuke you. The Lord himself punish you. The Lord himself deal with you. So if Michael is Yeshua, 
Why is Michael saying to the devil, I'm going to let the Lord deal with you because you're too great for me? Your rank is higher than me. Holy Spirit, give them revelation because I hope I'm not too heavy. Let me continue in, in the scripture. Before we go any further, let me tell you about the largest apologetic ministry in the world. Answers in Genesis. One of the main reasons children by college age are leaving the Christian faith is because they do not know how to defend. The Christian faith against the secular attacks of our day. Use the link in our description to get access to biblically-based Christian educational resources. Books, magazines, and other resources for all ages to bless your church, school, and home. Answers in Genesis. For those who desire a deeper walk and a thriving faith in the face of a growing cultural adversity. Now back to this fire teaching. Because I don't think y'all understand it this so let so let me finish it so we see how archangel michael deals with satan so now let's see what the lord and flesh does with satan right here then the devil led jesus to the holy city of jerusalem and put him on a high place of the temple the devil said if you are the son of god jump down because it is written in the scriptures he has put his angels in charge of you they will catch you in their hands so that you will not hit your foot on a rock Jesus answered him and also says in the scriptures, do not test the Lord your God. Do you see the difference? See, when Lucifer is in a dispute with Michael, Michael had to say what? Your rank is higher. Let the Lord deal with you. And now look at what happens when the Lord does deal with him. Jesus answered him, do not test the Lord your God. Then the devil led Jesus to the top of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And all this mud. the devil said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all these things. Jesus said to the devil, go away from me, Satan. It is written in the scriptures, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So the devil left Jesus. Angels came and took care of him. Do you see this? Don't you dare put Yeshua in the same class as Michael. He doesn't fit. He is God in the flesh. As confirmed in Isaiah 59, God said he couldn't find anyone, no one who could do his plan. No one who could intercede for the people. No one who could atone for the sins of the world. No one who could reconcile mankind back into a forever union with him. So what God the Son did, as the scripture says, it said by his own power. Y'all see that. It says he could not find anyone to help the people. And he was surprised that there was no one to help. So he used his own power to save the people. His own goodness. Yeshua himself is God in flesh, confirmed in Isaiah 59. God himself came into the flesh. God, by his own power, decided to give his life as a ransom to atone for sins. That's why you have to put your faith in him, because he is God. Only God himself could do the act, not the angels. No mankind could do it. Only God himself. It is only God himself who has the authority to save, who is mighty to save. It is only God who has the ability. It is only God who has the ability to rescue you from death, hell, and the grave. 
Who here is getting this? Who here is receiving something? Y'all need to realize the truth. You are in a cult and your cult is lying to you. Saying, well, we have to believe in Jesus. And yet you have to believe in Jesus for your salvation. But yet you will not praise him or acknowledge him as God. As God the Son. Even though in the scriptures it is plain. The same honor you give the Father, you must give to the Son. Because the son is the one who is worthy. The son is the one who came down. The son is the one who gave his Let him cook now. Let him cook. I said, let him cook. In fact, I'm going to share with y'all a revelation. Can I share something with you real quick? Oh no, God. No, God, please, no. No, no. No! Did you know that Jesus proved that he was the son? Because he said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Did you know that crucifixion, the act of crucifixion, it doesn't last for hours. It lasts for days. Oh, I hope you realize this. When you are crucified or the act of crucifixion, that is a penalty, a death penalty that lasts for days, not hours. In fact, when they wanted to hurry up and kill um, because they were still alive, they broke the legs of the, of the other two men who were on the cross, they broke their legs so that they couldn't lift themselves up so that they could hurry up and die. So when they go over to Yeshua to break his legs, they find that he's already dead. He's already dead. But do you understand how baffling that is? Because the Bible says death couldn't even touch him until he allowed it. Y'all, y'all not hearing this here. He was on the cross, and when he said, It is finished, when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and he dies, he doesn't die. Because of crucifixion, he dies because he gave up his life. Just like he said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. I don't know about you, but that's power right there. That's power. Look at this. I'm going to school some Jehovah Witnesses in a minute because I'm not done because my focus isn't even so much on Jehovah witness. My focus is on seeing the beauty and the power that, that Jesus is. Look at this. I'm going to go to revelation chapter one, verse 12. And here you will find, I turned to see who was talking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and someone among the lampstands who was like a son of man. He was dressed in a long robe and had a gold band around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like bronze that glows hot in a furnace, and his voice was like the noise of flooding water. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came out of his mouth. He looked like the sun shining at its brightest time. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to the place of the dead. Let me ask you something. Show me in the scripture where an angel says, I am the first and the last. 
show me in the scripture where it says that the angel, especially Michael says, I am the first and the last. Show me where the angel says, I hold the power of death and hell. I hold the power of death and hell. Show me in the scripture. You will find no one who says that. Only God himself says, I am the first and the last. And here it is, Yeshua saying, I am the first and the last. A title that only belongs to God. Isn't that beautiful? And to prove he is God, he says, I hold the keys to death in the place of the dead. He said, I was dead, but am alive and alive forevermore. I'm going to teach y'all something. Because I have to tell you, because the thing is, a lot of these Jehovah Witnesses like to say, "Well, hell doesn't exist. It's a, it's a, it's just that when you die, you die, and then the Lord will raise you up and whatever." But then they say that um, that hell doesn't exist, but when you die, you just become nothing. Jehovah Witnesses believe hell is not a place of eternal suffering, but is rather the common grave of humankind. The wicked are annihilated, but by what grounds? By what grounds are they judged and determined to be eliminated? The wicked, who's the wicked? On what grounds? Are you hearing this here? Let me tell you something. Hell is real. Do not be deceived. Hell is more real than the air you breathe right now. And I'm telling you, the gift of salvation in Christ is because he is the one who judges. So I tell you the truth. In John chapter 5, it says that all judgment has been handed over to the son. So the son, Yeshua, is the one who will judge where you go. And people think that, oh, well, hell is just for bad people. No, hell, there's a lot of good people in hell too. Hell has nothing to do with whether you're good or whether you're bad. It has to do with whether you are in union and if you know the Lord or not, or if you have the down payment of the Holy Spirit in you or not. It's about, do you love the Lord? It's about, are you in fellowship with the Lord? Because I tell you the truth, what you are doing right now on the earth, you are in training for reigning. The Jehovah Witnesses that continue to preach and say, oh, we are teaching the kingdom message. No, you're not. And we are followers of Christ. No, you're not. Because the kingdom message is heal the sick. Raise the dead, cast out devils, cure incurable diseases. I don't see no Jehovah Witnesses with power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, or cure incurable diseases. Nor when they pray do I see power. You proclaiming that you have the kingdom message, but you don't have power. You are a liar. The kingdom is not in word, but in power. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody say the kingdom is power. It is not in word. It's in power. You must have power. You cannot just preach the message. There has to be power that follows. And you only receive that power when you receive the Christ, and when you receive the Holy Spirit. What did the Lord said? To who have received him gave ye power. And when the Holy Ghost comes, you will receive power. I've prayed for people. I've seen demons flee. I've seen people get healed. I've seen miracles and breakthrough. We have a couple of miracles right now in the chat. 
So let me tell you something, Jehovah Witnesses. What is your track record that when you pray, we see people get healed? When you pray, we see people get delivered from demons and addictions and afflictions. All you can do is excommunicate people and act like a club and a cult. You have no power. When witches and warlocks come against you, you have no power. You can't take down no principality in a region or in the area. You can't do anything to enforce spiritual change into a region or into a location because you have no power. You don't preach the kingdom message because if you preached it, you would have power. Because God backs his word and he follows his word. Miracles do not perceive the word of God. It follows the word of God. I feel the Holy Ghost. Let me show y'all something. Hebrews 10. All you got to do is show them Hebrews 10 and you can destroy every teaching and ideology of not just the Jehovah Witnesses, but the Hebrew Israelites. I'm almost done, I promise. But look at this. The law is only an unclear picture of the good things coming in the future. It is not the real thing. The people under the law offer the same sacrifices every year, but the sacrifice can never make perfect those who come near to worship God. So say it again. Jehovah Witnesses base your things off of the work you've done. But here in scripture, it says no work you do will make you perfect or will make you right before God. Nothing. So let's continue. Can never make perfect those who come near to worship God. If the law could make them perfect, the sacrifices would have already stopped. The worshipers would be made clean and they would no longer have a sense of sin. But these sacrifices remind them of their sins every year because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So when Christ came into the world, uh oh, when who came into the world? Christ, God the Son, you do not want sacrifices and offerings. What does it say? It says, God the Father, Jehovah, Yahweh, does not want sacrifices and offerings. What does it say? But you have prepared a body for me. You do not ask for burnt offerings and offerings to take away sins. Then I say, look, I have come. It is written about me in the book. God, I have come to do what you want. In the scripture, he first said, you do not want sacrifices and offerings. You do not ask for burnt offerings and offerings to take away sins. These are all sacrifices that the law commands. Then he said, look, I have come to do what you want. God ends the first system of sacrifices so he can set up the new system. And because of this, we are made holy through the sacrifice Christ made in his body once and for all time. Every day, the priests stand and do their religious service, often offering the same sacrifices. Those sacrifices can never take away sins. What does that say? It says that none of your sacrifices, none of what you do, it will make you right with God. It will never take away your sins. So let me tell you something. So why do we live holy? Why do we live righteous? We live and we do good things because we are saved, not to get saved. Write that down. We do these things not in order to get salvation. It is because we are saved that we do this. That we love people. That we love creation. That we take care of the poor. That we take care of those in prison. That we take care of the orphans, the widows, and things like that. We don't do that for salvation. We do it because we have salvation. 
Let me move on. But after Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right side of God. And now Christ waits there for his enemies to put under his power. With one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also tells us about this. First, he says, this is the agreement I will make with them at that time, says the Lord. I will put my teachings in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he says, their sins and evil things they do, I will not remember anymore. Now then, these have been forgiven. There is no more need for a sacrifice of sins. It is because God himself is the atonement. Isn't that beautiful? Flawless victory.